At SIU, the student protest movement began not because of Vietnam, but because of a principle. For years, public schools and universities governed under the concept of in loco parentis, Latin for, in place of the parent. At SIU, they took the responsibility seriously. All students under 25 had to live on campus. There were no co-ed dorms. Vehicle ownership was restricted under threat of fine or academic probation. Women were restricted in their movements. On weekends, they could not stay out past 2 a.m. On weekdays, only 11.30. For men, two years of ROTC was a prerequisite for graduation. To make matters worse, Morris was no longer able to maintain the kind of personal contact with the students. It was not possible with a populace that exceeded 20,000. The first disturbances broke out at SIU in 1966. Finals were over, and alcohol flowed freely. For four nights, groups of partiers took to the streets, throwing rocks and eggs and overturning trash cans. Scores of photos captured the faces of the participants. Females were marked with arrows, presumably because they had broken curfew. More than 80 students were suspended or put on probation. A handful were expelled. Many students, however, thought the measures were too harsh and resentment for Morris began to rise. A few months later, he received a letter from a local woman describing a conversation overheard between some SIU students. You only think the students rioted last spring. Morris will be repaid for expelling those students. This town will really see a student riot in earnest. Morris thanked the writer for her concern and filed the letter away. By late 1967, the Board of Trustees was beginning to make headway on Morris's social science building. At a meeting in December, they awarded the design contract to Robert Geddes, a Harvard graduate who had narrowly missed the contract to design the Sydney Opera House just a decade before. At that same meeting, the board also advised that a committee be formed to review security in the event of a campus uprising. They hastened to add the move was a precautionary one. SIU was not a violent place, they claimed, merely a forum for healthy dissent. Nineteen sixty eight was a turbulent year. Drug use had skyrocketed. In nineteen sixty seven, arrests were up tenfold from the year before. Nineteen sixty eight was shaping up to be even worse. Tempers flared when Fred Halstead of the Socialist Workers spoke at an event. When Matt Cole of the American Nazis came to campus, the students nearly rioted. Morris struggled to keep his projects on schedule. The design for the Social Sciences Building was finalized. The cost was estimated at $5 million, with construction set to begin later that year. It would be a radical departure from the brick and mortar that had made up much of the university. The design was modern, brutalist they called it. The style had emerged out of the rubble of Great Britain following World War II. Poured concrete, unadorned, rough and unfinished made up all the surfaces. Rather than be hidden, utilities were left exposed. It was fast and cheap, the building blocks, some believed, for a new social utopia. Charles, Prince of Wales, would later joke, you have to give this much to the Luftwaffe. When it knocked down our buildings, it didn't replace them with anything more offensive than rubble. Universities, however, were quick to embrace the brutalist style and its utopian message. Yale, Dartmouth, and MIT had all experimented with it. 
not to be behind the times, SIU jumped on the bandwagon. Getty's design would be four stories tall and would cover 185,000 square feet of space. There would be air conditioning in the summer, heating in the winter, and carpet throughout. Morris had originally wanted to link the new building with the library, so students could go from one to the other, protected from the elements. But because the building was state-funded, he was overridden. If his troubles with the design weren't enough, that May he was faced with an explosive situation. On May 1st, the Student Senate voted to invite Stokely Carmichael, a leader of the Black Power Movement, to speak at SIU. They requested $1,500 from the university to cover his expenses. Campus conservatives, as well as many locals, balked at the idea. Morris was hesitant as well, recalling the coal incident. The decision he made could very well affect his future at SIU. The taxpayers have had enough of your catering to the low element of SIU. If you are not capable of saying no to a rabble-rouser, no-good, communist-trained Negro, one who should by rights be in jail, then it is time for you to step down. Sincerely, a good taxpayer. The next day, a fight nearly broke out between military recruiters and a group of anti-war protesters. Carmichael, some feared, would only add fuel to a smoldering fire. On May 7th, one problem would be solved.